There it is. There it Yay. is. Okay. Um, so again, if you guys have questions on the bottom right hand corner, there's a little Q, uh, square with a question mark. That's our Q and A. If you can direct it to panelists, all panelists, it would be Patty and myself, and we'll answer what we can. And we'll bring it up to uh, Irene when there are some questions to be had, uh, or that we feel that uh, you know you have a question chance there. And um, we will go from there. So I'm going to take it away there, Miss Irene. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Uh, we have, a, I, I have, I hope, a very nice program. And um, Sue was kind enough to give me more than an hour, an hour and a half, because I do tend to go over, and I will try very hard not to go over. Uh, but if you have to leave, I'm not going to be insulted. I do tend to go on, and uh, I hope that uh, there'll be enough time for me to be able to answer questions at the end. I did set an alarm on my uh, um, phone, cell phone, because I have no concept of time, as you can tell. So the alarms will go off to let me know, like I have 10 minutes left or whatever, so, they can, so then I can start speed talking. But anyway, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, shade gardening is very dear to my heart because uh, when we first moved here in 1984 or five, um, my gardening was unfortunately or fortunately in the shade, in the wooded area that we have, because my husband wouldn't give me any of his lawn. So I would say that I was gardening in the shady areas for at least 15 years, if not longer, until storms took some of those trees down, or I kind of finagled away to have a few beds in the sun. But I did enjoy my uh, shade garden, I still do, because it is wonderful, it's challenging, but oh, so rewarding. So here we go. All right, uh, there are benefits to shade gardening. Yes, there are. Uh, I personally do not like baking in the sun. If you want to torture me, you put me on a boat in the middle of a river with no book or nothing and just leave me in the sun and that to me is hell. So I love the shade. I do not like um, the hot sun and our humidity, so shade is wonderful. And it's always cooler in the shade, so you don't have to bake in the sun. Um, and also, you have fewer wrinkles, <laughs> uh, which uh, for some of us is important. Also, what's nice about um, when you have a garden in the shade, you have to water less often because there's not that much sun to dry out uh, the plants and the soil. And also the weeds don't grow, grow as quickly, but that's not to say that there aren't weeds because trust me, there are weeds everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is the secret of, uh, to a successful shade garden? Uh, well, when you're purchasing a plant, what is the most important thing to consider? Just like in real estate, it's location, location, location. And what does that mean? You need to choose the right plant for the right spot. What does that mean? You have to see how much, determine how much sun an area gets. You have to know when and for how long that site gets full sun. Um, and this you can do uh, during May, June, and July, not during the winter because you don't have those leaves. You do it after the canopies of the trees fill in. And the best way to figure that out, and it's really important to figure out how much sun you get, is using either your cell phone or a digital camera. And you go out there and take pictures at various times of the day. Doesn't have to be all in one day, it could be in a span of a week or two weeks. And the wonderful thing about uh, those uh, photos is they are time stamped. So you can see 11 o'clock, it was sunny, and 2 o'clock, oh my God, the sun wasn't there because we all think we have a lot more sun than we actually do. So this is really important. Now, full sun, everybody thinks they have full sun. Unless you have six or more hours, six to eight hours of sun, you do not have full sun. And this is mostly between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. And as I mentioned before, we grossly overestimate. I think we're eternal optimists and wish we and think that we have more than we do, which is kind of good in a way. All right, light shade. If you have just one tree, 
there's really not that much say, shade. So most plants that you can plant will grow quite well uh, in light shade. And uh, just remember that it's the afternoon sun that's the most intense and the hottest part of the day. And not all plants that do well in shady areas can tolerate that afternoon sun. So you have to do a little bit of research because they get sunburned and sun scald and they're not happy. Okay, part shade to part sun. This is a garden uh, that one of my friends had. And as you can see from one end of the garden to the other end of the garden, there is more uh, sun here and less sun here. So even in a garden bed, one part may have a different uh, amount of sun than the other part. And part shade, part sun is less than six hours of sun. And of course, there are a whole bunch of different uh, variables that give you that shade. Uh, and remember, it's that afternoon sun that is stronger than the morning sun. Full shade, as you can see, I took this uh, photograph uh, and uh, you can see that there are a lot of tall trees and this is an area that gets full shade, which means that they get at least four hours of full sun, mostly in the morning or late afternoon. And you can see from the picture that there are a whole bunch of impatience growing there. So it is definitely a shady situation. Dense shade, that that's less than four hours of full sun. Usually that's either from something that is solid like a fence or a house uh, blocking the sun or an evergreen uh, tree. And uh, if you do have that situation, it's really very hard to find plants that will grow there unless you're into growing mushrooms. Uh, now, if you have an uh, all-day dappled shade or dappled sun, uh, on the left is uh, an area in my garden um, that used to be. That tree is now gone. But as you can see, there are huge areas where the sun is dancing on the, on the ground. Um, and over here, this is in a woody area, and I have some of that also. And as you can see, not all areas get some sun. This area here, not that much. Here, uh, it, there is some sun, but not always. And it's not always, uh, doesn't stay there all the time. So what does that mean? This area is considered part shade, part sun. And over here, it's considered full shade. Yes, full shade doesn't mean under your porch shade but it is full shade so it gets at least four hours of sun whether it's directly or dappled and over here it's deep or dense shade and yes things will grow you can see here from this picture that there are fewer things growing here than where there is more sun peeking through the most difficult, of course, is dry shade. And why <laughs> you can see this guy, uh, lots of plants die because there's a lot of competition uh, from the roots of the trees, plus the thick canopy of the trees doesn't allow the sun to shine through. You may have walls, eaves, or fences that don't allow the sun to come through and also the rain to come in. Um, or you may have soil that drains too quickly. Those of you who have sandy soil, especially in the set in the shade and also slopes where the moisture just runs off when it's raining so shade really robs plants of the sun's energy and like humans and other living things we all most of us 99.99 percent of living things on earth really need that sun and uh the dryness really makes it uh, uh very difficult for plants to do well so what do you do if you do have dry shade? If you can thin out the canopy, of course, you have to hire somebody unless you like to climb trees, but that helps. Um, also in the beginning, try to install some sort of irrigation soaker hoses. I highly recommend because you can leave them there and then take them away once the plants are established, which I will talk about later. You can amend the soil with organic material, especially those of you who have sandy soil because that organic material uh, uh, lets the moisture stay there a bit longer than if you didn't have that. 
Also, you need to choose drought tolerant plants. Now, uh, when you're buying your plants, you look for the symbols like a cactus or this watering can or other symbols or words that say that they are drought tolerant. Now, when a plant is drought tolerant, that doesn't mean that you bring it home, you know, dig a hole, you put it in the hole, you water it, and then you walk away. No, in order for a plant to be drought tolerant, you need to get it established. What does that mean? That means that you need to water that plant every day, every other day, or whatever uh, you think it needs, especially if it's it's warm until one day you yank it, you take the, the plant and you uh, yank it a little bit. And if it doesn't move, that means that it feels that it's at home. It uh, allowed its roots to go out into your soil and it is established because it says to itself, I am here, I am home, this is where I'm going to be. And once your plants are established, um, especially the first year, if it's a droughty period, period or, or a very hot period, you will need to water it from time to time. But usually after the first year, especially perennials, you really don't have to worry about watering very often. So if you can uh, buy uh, drought tolerant plants, it's a wonderful thing, but you need to take care of it before it becomes really drought tolerant. Also, plant early in the season. Uh, we have a lot of rain in the spring, uh, so that is a great time to plant because you'll be getting water and you don't have to go out there to do that. I let my leaves fall and I leave them to do their job. And the job that they do is they act as a mulch so the soil does not uh, get dry. Uh, the moisture stays in, and also as the leaves decompose, it's give, giving the soil time release uh, nutrients that are great for your plants. So leave those leaves there. It really irks me when I'm driving and I see all these leaves and bag leaves that are out there instead of them putting them under shrubs or in areas that can use that wonderful uh, mulch as well as uh, nutrients. And if you can, uh, encourage reseeding plants. Anytime you have a plant that self sows, all those little plants, all those little volunteers or babies that germinate are usually a lot stronger, more resilient than a plant that you would buy at um, a garden center because they know where they are, they adapt very well. Whereas the bought plant, you have to really coddle it and make sure that it's well established. If you have dry shade, this will be in the handout that you will be getting um, soon. Uh, and all the names of these plants are here. I will try to talk about most of these plants, but due to my time constraints, I will not be talking about all of them, but some of them. So these are really great plants, but again, make sure that they are well established first. All right, uh, so um, this is a summary of uh, how much sun uh, an area gets, and that is in your handout, so you don't have to be writing notes. And uh, when you're looking, you need to read the labels, and the labels usually have some sort of indication of what the sun requirements are. And uh, so full sun, this is not a plant that you can plant in a shady area. I know we all think, oh, yeah, it will do very well. Well, no, it won't because it really needs that sun. And it may look good for maybe a season or a few weeks, but the next year it's not going to look great. It may not even come back. Now, um, when you have a plant like this one that has two different indications of what kind of sun requirement it has, the first one is always the optimal one. That one, the plant will do quite well, whereas the second one, it will tolerate. The plant may not have as many blooms, it may not be as lush, but it'll do okay. It won't just wither away. But if you can, try to plant the plant with the uh, first one that's um, given you. Okay. Uh, let's go into colors now. Look at this green. <laughs> plants are green. They all, most of them have green. And what's wonderful about uh, this plant, this was taken in October at Longwood Gardens, which you should visit. 
And these are perennials and shrubs, and these are evergreen. And even though you don't see any flowers, any blooms at all, it looks interesting because of the different leaf shapes and sizes and the, little, the differences in the green color. So this is what you'd like to have, especially in the wintertime. It's nice to have something nice to look at. Uh, here, uh, this is at another uh, botanical garden that I went to. And here you have different colors of green. And yes, the leaves are all the same shape and size. But look at this. This has chartreuse. And this one over here has blue. And this one here, even though it's the same size, has those two colorings in the leaves. So that makes it really pretty, even though there are no blooms. And believe me when I tell you, more uh, all plants, most perennials and shrubs are usually more not in bloom, longer not in bloom than in bloom. So you have to think about the leaves and the colorings. Chartreuse, isn't it wonderful? Gold of any kind, whether it's on your finger or necklace or in your garden, gold is beautiful. And these are all listed in your handout. Um, gold is, uh, or chartreuse is really great. This was at Deep Cut Gardens on a really crappy day. It was raining, it was cold. It was awful, but I took this picture just to show you how uh, these plants that are chartreuse or gold makes it look like the sun is shining there. Also, whenever you have chartreuse foliage, when you're when you look at the garden, where do your eyes go first? At the gold and chartreuse plants, they're basically head turners white pops in the dark and you will see this little horsey here uh, this is listed in your uh, handout as not a plant to plant even though i i had it this is my garden i've been yanking it out for the last 10 years so please do not plant this but white really pops in the in the garden and you can see here i have the still bees that are blooming white so if you can add some white in the garden now, variegation is having more than one color on a leaf. And here are plants that are either gold or chartreuse or cream or white, either in the margins or in the center. Uh, these are perennials. Here are some shrubs. And these are all listed in your handout. Silver, can you believe silver? Oh my God, a lot of silver plants are shade plants, really lovely. And usually the under, um, under the silver is usually a nice deep green. And these are also listed in your handout. And I think I'll be talking about all of these uh, as the program progresses. Red, maroon, burgundy, bronze, whatever you want to call it. We have annuals, we have perennials, and bulbs, all kinds of wonderful coloring. Purple, my favorite color. There are even purple foliage plants, which are really great. And then black. Can you believe black plants? Really uh, amazing. Uh, they really started getting popular a number of years ago. And again, these are all listed. Uh, I put this slide here, uh, and you can see that a lot of these plants are dark foliaged. And that is nice when you're looking at it during the day. However, once it starts getting dark, when you're looking at this across the way or even right there, all you'll be seeing is this. So this will all look like a black hole. So be careful how many you plant next to each other, especially if you're the type that likes to sit out on the patio or um, in your backyard with a glass of wine and you want to be looking at something pretty. Uh, be careful as far as dark foliage plants. And look at this. We have plants that have all these wonderful colorings. How gorgeous. Some are annuals and some are perennials. Um, be besides coloring of the of the leaves, the foliage, we also have look at all the different types of leaves that we have, unbelievable. And these you can find in uh, on the internet very easily. Uh, so what's important about that is uh, if you have contrasting shapes and sizes, 
sizes of leaves that will result in contrasting textures, which is really important in order to make your garden that's not in bloom all the time looking great. Now, here is one type of uh, leaf, which is ferns or fern-like. It's lacy, delicate, airy, and for some, it looks rough instead of smooth. If you have this kind of planting, make sure that next to it, you have a bold leaf or a solid leaf plant next to it or near it because this could get quite busy and the contrast really makes the, the bed look really beautiful. Here is an example of the corridolus with this hosta. Look how pretty that looks. This is in one of my beds that used to be. Uh, as you all know, those of you who garden, a bed never stays the same. It keeps on changing. Plants get bigger, you need to divide them or whatever. Or in my situation, the deer arrived. So my hostas and other plants are not there anymore. But look at the lacy foliage of this uh, um, frilly uh, bleeding heart. If there were no blooms, this would still look very pretty because you uh, there is echoing of the leaf color as well as all the different shapes and sizes of the foliage. And then you have grass-like foliage, grass or grass-like, and I will be talking about these also. And please try not to plant them together, the different types, because it really doesn't... It, doesn't make it interesting as far as when the plants are not in bloom. And here is overall, I know these are grasses, but this is the usual overall shapes of most plants. And that too, you need to be careful about or think about when you're planting plants next to each other. And I know I'm going a lot about plants, uh, all the foliage and stuff like that, rather than giving you all the plants, which I will be doing soon. But you have to realize that in the garden, in a shade garden, you are going to be looking a lot at the foliage, at the shape of the plants, the shape of the leaves. So that's something that you should consider. Um, and here is a good example of the various shapes. Here we have a mounded, we have an upright, we have the grass, we have spreading, really very pretty. And look, not one bloom in sight, but isn't that a beautiful sight? All right, this I found this morning, believe it or not, in fine gardening, so I figured I'd put it in. And uh, I don't know whether you read quickly or not, but it basically says that you have to really pay attention to the fold of shape and the foliage of the plants rather than the flowers so that you will have a beautiful garden. All right, now we're going to go into plants. So you choose plants with multi-seasons of interest. I like uh, to buy plants that give you the most bang for your buck. Uh, the first ones that we're going to go through are the most difficult ones, and this is for full shade. Full shades, remember, no less than four hours of full sun or all day dappled sun. Uh, I will start out with shrubs, which I think are really important because they, uh, they are the skeleton of the garden and also evergreen shrubs, so you can have something pretty to look at during the winter. Then I will be talking about perennials, and perennials are any plants that live three years or more, uh, and then annuals that uh, they don't overwinter very well. The frost kills them. Okay, these are the symbols that I'm going to use. I'm not going to go over them because that would take time. But here is my first plant. I love, oh, you're going to hear me say that a lot, and I'm sorry if I'm going to be repeating myself. This is such a wonderful shrub. It's evergreen. It has these thick, leathery leaves that are splashed with gold. Um, really great. Uh, I hear uh, on all of my slides, I will tell you the botanical name or scientific name and also the common name which changes depending on where you're from. Uh, I also will tell you what kind of sun situation and this plant can take a good amount of shade. In fact, it can also be grown as a house plant 
that's how much shade it can take. So this plant can be planted under deciduous trees very nicely. Deciduous means that the leaves fall uh, and they don't stay on the trees during the winter. So uh, I tell you how tall and how wide the plant will be because that's important so that you don't plant these wonderful shrubs in front of windows too close to driveways or pathways. And also the zone, we are anywhere from 6B to 7B. Uh, so uh, I tell let you know because you really want your plants to come back the next year or over winter very well. The Christmas tree means that it's evergreen easy care, no maintenance, I really mean no maintenance, and it's evergreen for seasons of color. Um, many shrubs, not all, need to have a male and a female in order to have berries. This is a female, no berries, but it still looks very pretty, and it needs a male pollinizer nearby, Mr. Goldstrike, Mr. Golden King, really nice names. Um, and as you can see, um, it can grow under a tree very well because it is very drought tolerant. I also will tell you um, something interesting like either the foliage or if it has berries, uh, how slowly or quickly it grows, and also very important, what kind of soil it needs. Soil tolerant means that it can take either sandy soil or clay soil. I I have clay soil, lots of it. And some areas are loamy, but very few. So these, this plant can grow in either sandy or uh, clay soil, average to rich soil. Rich soil means that you need to amend it and compost or compost and manure is a wonderful thing to add. Uh, and once it's established, it can uh, compete with uh, tree roots very well. Apubas come also in solid green color and also uh, the type of variegation, sulfur and picturata, which I have in your handout. Oh, and when you see this thing over here, that means the deer love it. I grew one that grew to 10 feet tall and wide well, eight feet, and it was just gorgeous until one day I came down to where it was growing and I just saw a mohawk. They ate all the leaves on the side and couldn't reach the top ones. And after a while, the, the whole shrub disappeared because the deer just feasted on it. So besides the deer, the only other thing that I cannot take is in standing water. The roots will drown and it will die. And here's the Grim Reaper to show you that it really likes it dry or regular. It doesn't have to be dry, but it cannot take any kind of standing water. So make sure you don't plant it near a downspout. Now, those of you who live by the shore, you will see this, these symbols, the, the wind and the salt spray. So this can take it very well because not all plants can tolerate that wind or that salt. This is another one uh, that I love and that I have because the deer don't eat it. Why? Look at the leaves. They're thick and they're spiny. And thank God for that because uh, I have a few of these. It does self sow, but not, not, not crazy. I have a few of these and these I have planted under trees or tall shrubs. They do very well, uh, can tolerate uh, the roots of trees and what's nice is this is during the winter the buds start to form and then they open up to these beautiful yellow flowers that are, are fragrant and then these flowers turn into these droops or berries that look like uh, they're grapes, hence the name grape holly. Very easy care, four seasons of color, and pollinators just love these blooms, especially uh, those early pollinators because this starts blooming at, towards the uh, late winter when our native pollinators are out. Um, Let's see, and it can be pruned very hard. <laughs> and how, how do I know that? Because my son and my husband, they knocked it over and, and cracked it and it came back very well. So pruning is fine and it can take the shore very well. This plant is a wonderful plant if you don't have a big garden. This is Skimia japonica, it's evergreen. This is what it looks like in the winter. 
how gorgeous. And those berries, they stay there a long time because the birds don't seem to be happy with those berries. So they don't eat them very well. They also, they form um, these berries um, in the latter part of summer, fall, and there's also buds that are formed. Here are the female buds that open up to these flowers in the spring, and here are the male buds. Of course, the males have to be bigger, and here are the male blooms. Um, they're really a uh, no-care type of a plant, and I have them on in a lot of areas in my garden. Uh, this, you people down in Ocean County or wherever you have sandy soil, this is God's gift to you. This is God's answer to a lawn in a wooded area. Uh, this is what it looks like in the spring and uh, during uh, some of the season. And then what do you get? You get these wonderful blooms that become these wonderful blueberries that are so nutritious and you can eat them. And hopefully you eat them before the birds and the deer eat them. Um, really great, um, very drought tolerant. I mean, they have to be. If they're living in a forest or in the woods where there's a lot of tree roots, they have to be really drought tolerant and especially loving sandy soil. I've tried growing it in my clay soil and they weren't really happy and they kind of disappeared. They just go away quietly. Uh, and they do uh, produce nice colonies after a while. And this is the bonus. Besides, you couldn't get to the blueberries before the birds and the deer. Look at all the beautiful foliage that you see in the fall. When you're on Route 70 or parts of uh, 18 or uh, the parkway in the fall, all that nice red that you see, those are those low bush blueberries. And this is a wonderful plant for you to have instead of those invasive um, Oh God, I forgot what the name is. I'll think of it. But anyway, this is a native to New Jersey and to a lot of the East Coast. Uh, grow is, and look at the zone, zone two. So you can grow it in a container if you want. But it does like rich fertile soil. Remember in the woods, is there anybody out there blowing the leaves away or a rake? Who uses a rake anyway nowadays? But those leaves, they fall and they decompose and they make the soil really rich with those nice nutrients as they decompose. So do yourself a favor, please uh, grow these wonderful low bush blueberries. Hellebores. Hellebores do what no other perennials do. They start blooming in late winter. They are evergreen. They have these. Uh, this is Orientalis, which was chosen perennial of the year in 2005. Has these, these wonderful leathery leaves uh, that stay there all season long. They're evergreen. These are some of the blooms that they have. And no, that's not on one plant. Each plant has its own coloring. And uh, after it's done blooming and the seed uh, starts to form, this stays and it looks like it's uh, it's blooming and that will stay until May. It starts late winter and then continues and looks good through May, even June. Uh, one of the reasons why they're very drought tolerant and don't mind being under trees, deciduous trees, is because they develop a long tap root. So when you have it, make sure you pick the spot where you want it because if you don't get the full tap root, if you want to move it, that plant may not make it. However, what's really great about uh, this Lenten rose is it does self-sow. So after uh, probably about two years or three years, it will self-sow. And uh, you can take those babies and plant them wherever you want or give them to friends or make new friends and uh, have, let them be lucky to have this wonderful plant. Um, uh, the hellebores, they do take a while to get established. So instead of like a month or so, like regular perennials, this may take up to a year to get established. So make sure that you water it. And again, make sure you plant it under deciduous trees rather than evergreens because they really like that winter sun because that, that sun gives them that energy to have these wonderful blooms. 
Uh, this is the picture that I showed you before, and this is that same or a Lenten rose, and here are the blooms, and here are some examples. And uh, the thing with a, a Lenten rose is the blooms sort of face down. <laughs> so you sort of have to bend a little in order to see it. However, the Christmas rose or the Helleborus niger, the blooms are facing up. And there is a, a whole bunch of nice ones out there. Amazing. And what's nice about them also, their foliage is different, a bit different, but still nice and leathery and evergreen than the Orientalis. Um, but uh, look at all the different hybrids of the different hellebores. These look artificial, don't they? But they are for real. And they bloom for a long time, really low maintenance. And low maintenance, what do I mean by that? After a harsh winter, there may be some leaves that look you know, kind of terrible. So you just uh, yank them off or cut them off. But after a while, each of these plants will look like a shrub because they grow that nicely, uh, up to 24 inches uh, high and wide. If you have deer and you cannot grow hosta, you can grow this rodea. Rodea would you believe Rutgers in their garden have been growing it for over 25 years? This is evergreen. I am showing you evergreen plants first. This is what the bloom looks like and then the berries. This is snow. So the deer do not bother this at all. This is a good luck plant or a sacred lily. Years ago, if you wanted to buy one, it would cost a thousand dollars. Now they have variegated ones and other ones that cost a really a lot less. And the reason why this is a sacred lily or good luck plant in Japan and China, when somebody um, opens a business or uh, buys a house, this is what they give them as a good luck plant because it can be grown as a house plant and it connotes, you know, longevity, et cetera, and good luck. So if you can grow this, please do. Carex. There are so many Carexes. Uh, some of them are evergreen, some are not. This one I have in my yard, and also I don't have a sidewalk, so I edge my garden bed um, by the street with this plant. Um, it has this wonderful margin of um, cream or white. These are the blooms, which is nothing to write home about. But this is not, it spreads a bit, but not crazy. It's hardy, and the deer usually don't eat them. I do have groundhogs, so sometimes I don't know it's the deer or it's the groundhogs, because you have to remember that when deer are hungry and they have nothing else to eat, they will eat poisonous plants also because they need to be eating and also they need that moisture in whatever it is that they're eating. Uh, this is a wonderful plant in that it can tolerate our New Jersey heat, drought, our humidity being wet also. So this is a great plant that can be in any area, whether it's part shade, shade, and I think even the sun too. Uh, it's evergreen, and uh, I use it in a lot of areas in my garden. This is a wood spurge. This is a cousin to our wonderful poinsettia. This is the flower. These are the bracts, just like on the poinsettia. Those red things that you think that's the bloom are really the bracts. This is evergreen, and it's a, it makes a really great ground cover. There's no maintenance whatsoever. This is what it looks like. It has nice dark green foliage, which looks great next to any kind of plant that has any kind of coloring. Here it is in a bed. Look how wonderful. It's great. I have it growing under trees in an area that I have to admit, I've neglected a few beds for a number of years. And this plant is still there. This is what it looks like when it's in bloom. And here's another uh, picture of what the blooms look like. Really a wonderful plant if you have that 
full shade situation and of course it is poisonous and it has a sap just like all euphorbia most euphorbias do so blondes especially uh, if you get the sap on you you may get a rash so if you're working with this you need to be wearing gloves uh, this has gotten an award from the royal horticultural society so if the brits like it you have to like it too only kidding. But really, I recommend it if you have a lot of trees and really shady areas. It's a really no fuss type of a plant to have. Dead nettle, what an awful name. I like lamium. Lamium, you can see the silver on the leaves, different uh, splotchings, as well as uh, gold and silver. The blooms are either lavender, pink, or white. And uh, it makes a really great ground cover, no maintenance whatsoever. And it is, it is, believe it or not, um, evergreen. However, when you look at it, it just, you know, cuddles up and it's just, you know, takes as little space as it can, most likely protecting itself. Um, uh, deer don't eat it. And as you can see here, it has malodorous foliage, very musky. And deer don't like anything that has an aroma, even if it's a pleasant one for us. Uh, so if you have a lot of deer, pick plants that have some sort of aroma to its foliage or its blooms. As you can see, poor to average soil. So those of you who don't feel like amending your soil and doing nothing from your soil, this is a wonderful plant to have. This makes a wonderful ground cover. I have this, it's a, a big foot of crane's bill or geranium, real geranium. Macrorhizum means that it has really huge rhizomes or root system that resemble uh, the kind that uh, German irises have. And because they're so big, this is a wonderful ground cover to have because it doesn't give any weeds any room to grow. So it, it looks pretty. It's also evergreen. And again, it stays close to the ground. This is what the fall coloring looks like. These are the beautiful blooms. It also comes in a lighter pink and also in white. Uh, the foliage is great. And the deer don't eat it but they do eat the blooms because like us we like the zucchini blooms <laughs> they also are sophisticated and like to eat uh, the nice juicy buds and the flowers this is this uh, spreads nicely but not crazy and i have this uh, as part of a divider between my neighbor under some of the trees that are there the evergreen trees and it grows very nicely and i don't do anything it self sows and what's really great about this plant is that it can be in the sun in the shade part shade it can take dry it can take wet and you can have it by the shore and it'll grow well in containers so you have all kinds of great things grow, going for it Epimediums, They're, they take a bit uh, to get established, sometimes a year, two years, maybe even longer. But once they're established, and they are a bit on the expensive side, they will give you years and years and years of really, uh, these are workhorses in your shade garden. They can tolerate dry areas once they're established or wet. Some of them have this uh, nice uh, red coloring in the spring. These three are the most popular ones, pink blooms, um, yellow blooms, as well as uh, um, lavender type of blooms and the different leaf shapes. Really a wonderful plant. The, the leaves and the stems look so delicate. It's surprising that these can be evergreen. And here are some of the different varieties. Uh, aren't they adorable? Really very pretty. Some of them look like little daffodil blooms. Really cute. 
Uh, Ajuga, yes, it does tend to spread, but this one is a really great one. Um, it has won it awards, and um, it's it's named because of the small leaves that have a chocolatey chocolatey coloring to them, and look how nicely it looks in between uh, pavers. It has the standard uh, blue blooms in the spring. It is evergreen, and uh, it's easy to yank out if you think it goes out of. Uh, and and here are some of the different other varieties. Uh, these are great in containers because they tend to cascade over the edges of the pot. So that makes that uh, container garden really interesting. And as you can see, pollinators love the blooms as well as hummingbirds. So this is nectar filled plants, uh, blossoms. Okay, uh, I love this plant but I love them all. This is um, European ginger. It has these beautiful kidney-shaped uh, leaves that are deep green and shiny. It takes a little bit for them to get established, but then once they get established, they form a nice clump. They don't, they're not really big, big spreaders, but once they feel that they, they're at home, they may even self-sow, but not crazy. You may find one like, you know, 15 feet away or 20 feet away. These are the blooms, which you really can't see unless you're lying on the ground. And you wonder, how is it that that plant is, uh, a little volunteer is like 15 or 20 feet away? Well, it's the ants that take the seeds and then deposit them uh, elsewhere. This is a Chinese uh, wild ginger. This one spreads more quickly than uh, the other one. Look at the beautiful silver blotching on this. The blooms are also on the ground. They're a little bit different. Another name for this plant is panda, blue, uh, panda flower you know, China, Panda. Anyway, these are really pretty. They are not evergreen, neither is the other one, but it gives you nice three seasons of interest. No maintenance, and believe it or not, pollinators like it. And usually those are the beetles and stuff like that, not the butterflies going under there. Loves clay for those of you who have clay, but can tolerate, uh, um, sandy soil too and look at all the attributes that it has you can't kill this plant this is one of the most popular ferns that you can get out there really beautiful uh, foliage as i've mentioned before is really important in the shade garden and look how lovely it looks next to a plant that has dark foliage because it has some of that coloring besides the silver and it has a red stem and this is a great plant that is zone three that can grow in a container and come back every year because if you're planting a container we're a zone 6b 7b so if you were planting containers the zone of the plant you're planting needs to be two zones cooler than us. So it has to be five or four, or this one is three. And it will definitely come back. And how wonderful to have a container that already has something in it. And then you just add a few annuals or something else there too. It was chosen uh, perennial of the year. And those plants that are chosen perennial of the year, they're chosen by the industry, by growers, um, garden centers, et cetera, because they are easy to grow and usually can grow all over the United States. And this plant can grow in the sun, part shade, uh, full shade. And you know what a lousy summer we had where we had a droughty period? Well, I thought I lost my uh, my Japanese painted fern, but lo and behold, it did come back. So it's really a wonderful plant. And for beginner gardeners, this is a must to have in your garden. And when it's happy, it will self sow. You'll see some growing here and there, which is so wonderful. I love little gifts like that. Uh, and if you like uh, the Japanese painted fern, 
This is ghost fern that has the silver recoloring and the more sun that it gets, the more silver it is. However, as the season progresses, it turns more into the green, but it still has that silvery coloring. This is a cross between that Japanese painted fern and our Southern lady fern, our native lady fern. And look, it got an award from the British. Uh, this also is very drought tolerant, as you can see by the cactuses here, and very, uh, tolerant of whatever soil it's in and another plant that you can plant look at that zone four in a container to have to come back every single year pulmonaria uh, or longwort this mrs moon was my first pulmonaria and i love it for a number of reasons um, but one of the reasons is the deer don't, uh, don't eat this also it's one of the first perennials to bloom other than hellebores and it starts blooming before even all the leaves come in this one starts out pink and then uh goes into blue and uh some people think that uh the plant turns out the flower turns blue when the pollinators have taken all the nectar so it's basically giving the pollinators a message uh kitchen clothes we're done go somewhere else because there are there's no more nectar here pulmonarias as you have uh, and the hummingbirds love this and of course this is an early bloomer april to may by the way all the plants that i'm showing you i'm showing you in the chronological order in which they bloom some of the ones that are evergreen i've shown in the beginning just to show you you have something to look at in the winter and look at the different pulmonarias oh my god with the different splotching the whole leaf uh the flower the blooms are either white pink, various shades of pink, blue, purple. This one has a blue ensign, blue flowers, but the leaves are all green. And look at this one, really um, beautiful foliage. So you have something interesting to look at because this blooms in the spring from April to May, a nice long time, so it's a long bloomer. However, you have all this beautiful foliage and if it's happy, it will self-sow, which to me is a gift. Uh, this was chosen perennial of the year, uh, Jack Frost Brunera or Brunera, both pronunciations are correct. What's amazing about this plant, besides its gorgeous foliage, is that uh, deer don't eat it because it has a, a hairy type of or fuzzy type of uh, leaf, uh, you know, like a cat's tongue. And deer are very particular as far as mouthfeel, and they will not eat this. But besides that, those little forget-me-not blooms, they will bloom for six weeks nonstop, and you don't have to deadhead. Deadhead meaning, means taking away, uh, snipping off any blooms that are, have faded. And uh, some plants you need to deadhead in order to get more blooms, and some others you just do that, you know, so they'll be looking neat. This does not need any deadheading. And the other thing that is really wonderful about this plant is that it will self-sow. You can, whenever any plant I tell you self-sows, that means you can buy seeds and grow this uh, from seed, which is a lot more economical than buying the plant. Now, when they do self-sow, the leaves may not have all the silvery uh, coating on there, but still you will get the blooms and it'll make, make a nice little patch of area of this wonderful plant that can either take um, drought or being wet. Ephemerals. Ephemeral means um, fleeting or not long lasting. This is our native Virginia bluebells. Yes, even in New Jersey, even though it's called Virginia, it's um, a native on the East Coast and in other areas. It either comes in blue, which is the most uh, common one. The buds are adorable. They are pink and then they open up into these fluted uh, trumpet-like blooms, also in white and even rarer pink. Uh, this is in the wild. Now ephemerals, as I mentioned, fleeting, just like daffodils. They come up 
they do their thing, they bloom, and then the foliage, uh, and they, they bloom in the spring before the leaves fill in the, the canopy of the trees. Once the canopy is filled in, then it gets really um, uh, shady. However, just like the daffodils, they'll disappear and they'll come back the next year. What's nice about these, this will naturalize. Whenever you see will naturalize, that means that it will self-sow and you too may have something as beautiful as this. These here are more of these sleeping beauties, these ephemerals that uh, this one's native to New Jersey as well as this one. This one is not, this was in one of my garden beds a while ago. And as I said, beds always change, plants either disappear or you put in new ones. This blooms and self sows very nicely. I have yet to grow the pink one, but if you can, please visit in the spring Bowman's Hills Flower Preserve or Mount Cuba Center, and that's in the handout. And I have the address there as well as the site where you can find all that information. This is bleeding heart. I know a lot of people think that this is a native to New Jersey. No, it comes from Japan, but that's okay. Uh, it either comes in pink blooms like this in the spring or white or even red. This is what it looks like. And it is also an ephemeral. It's very long lived. However, the whole thing dies back just like a daffodil just like daffodils do. And this is what it looks like. So if you have this growing in your garden, make sure that you plant plants that will, uh, you won't notice that there's a hole in that area and you don't wanna be digging there because you really want them to come back. Uh, it does like fertile soil. And again, remember what I said, in the wooded areas, what happens? The leaves fall, enriching the soil. So it's used to having nice, rich, fertile soil, which uh, you can do also. And I know it looks kind of strange, but hummingbirds can actually get the nectar from these uh, wonderful blooms. And look at this. This is gold heart. The foliage is chartreuse or gold. The more sun it gets, the more gold the, the foliage is. It has these pink blooms. There's also a white one. And I know it's hard to believe, but it grows well in the shade in a container. This is one of my containers. And if you keep watering, make sure that it doesn't dry out. It will last the whole season long. It will not disappear. Look how beautiful it looks with the hosta and the hakoni grass. This one, I can't say enough. This is another one of those that keeps the weeds at bay because it does self sow. What's great about it is it's poisonous, so the deer and the rabbits will not eat it. It has this beautiful buttercup yellow blooms from April to June. Look at this, how it's filled up with these blooms. Look how gorgeous the buds and the seed pods look. Uh, the deer don't eat it, not only because it's poisonous, but because it has um, a fuzzy leaf. So they don't like that either. What's great about this is it blooms a lot from April to May and then sporadically until frost. So you'll always have some blooms and it does self so nicely. So, and what's nice about it, it will germinate, not in a sunny area, it knows exactly where it should germinate and it will germinate uh, and you'll have these wonderful little babies, this volunteers uh, in part shade area or full shade area. Long blooming and look at all the sun, shade, uh, wet, dry, our humidity, a great plant that can cover an area very nicely. And look how pretty it is in the wild. Doesn't that remind you of Monet? And what's wonderful about uh, this, um, combination is these are really ephemerals. They will die back and leave a hole here, but this will last all season long. So it hides that hole that is left there. Now, if the area where you have this does dry out a lot, 
It will disappear, but it will come back the next spring. I highly recommend this. This plant is grown for its foliage. Again, foliage is really important in the shade. Uh, in the spring, it has these little ding dong bell flowers uh, that are uh, that pollinators love. They are fragrant, uh, has no serious uh, problems. This is what it looks like in the spring. How cool is that? And the stem remains a nice uh, reddish color. Uh, what's amazing is that uh, as the stems come up, they sort of lean over like a fountain and they all do lean all in the same direction, which is kind of cool. It was chosen as perennial of the year in 2013, again, because of ease of growing them. And this is what happens in the fall. And this is the fall coloring before it dies back. Very long lived plant and deer don't usually eat it. Tiarella, uh, this is a native of New Jersey and other areas. Um, this has these wonderful blooms that are called foam flower because it looks foamy from a distance. It is um, shallow rooted. So this is one of these plants that you can underplant rhododendrons or azaleas or other shrubs as a ground cover because it doesn't compete with the um, roots of, of the shrubs. Uh, you can see here planted along a pathway. It does bloom only in the spring from May to June, but it has beautiful foliage and uh, interesting foliage. Uh, look at these. Look at these. Who remembers Iron Butterfly? And the blooms, they come in either white or pink. Uh, look at the different shapes of the foliage. Uh, really nice. And um, if you, when you're looking at the label, if it says cordifolia, that means it's a spreader. It will spread. Uh, if it doesn't have that, then it's a clumper. Uh, some of them, like this one, it's called running tapestry. <laughs> Why? Because it does spread, which is great in a container too. This is yellow archangel or lamiastrum. Uh, this is Herman's pride. Please get Herman's pride, not the regular one because that one is uh, a runner. It, it just goes nuts and spreads like crazy. This one does not. This one is a nice clumper. It blooms these nice blooms in this from May to July. And then you have this checkerboard silver type of foliage that looks lovely even in the deep shade. It can take everything uh, except for standing water. Hasta. Yes, dear, love them. I can't grow them anymore. They are gorgeous. They come in either like an inch and a half of small two leaves that are at least 20 inches long uh, and six feet wide. They're uh, straight colors and variegated ones. Uh, the blooms are either white or lavender. Most of them are lavender. When you have the white ones, they're fragrant. Some people like the blooms. There are other people, when I was working at garden centers, that would say that they cut off the blooms because they feel that it takes away from the beauty of the foliage. Uh, the leaves, unfortunately, slugs love them, unless you have uh, some of the hostas that are really thick, have thick foliage. Uh, average to fertile soil. Look at all that they can take. They are truly wonderful plants, unless you have deer. And even the hummingbirds love them. Here we have um, different uh, solid colored uh, hostas. The more green or blue, the more it can take shade it can take. The more gold or chartreuse in the leaf, the more sun it can take. It really doesn't like full sun. Uh, it does need some shade. And uh, again, they come, this one is a nice short one called Gold Edger, which makes a really nice edging. I didn't name these in your handout because each year they come out with so many. And I think so many of them resemble the ones that I've seen before, but they are really, truly great. And if you have no deer, 
I am so envious to <laughs> grow them because this is another plant that's hard to kill. And also, this is a wonderful plant to put in a container because look at this, they're hardy to zone three. So this is another plant that will keep coming back in your containers. They don't need dividing. The longer they stay in one spot, the nicer the leaf. This is my favorite, Great Expectation. It's a slow-growing one. These are the juvenile leaves. This is what the leaves look like for the first five years. And then after that, look how gorgeous. It's corrugated, thick, slug-proof, basically. And this gets more sun. This, is, this gets less sun. And this is another one, Summon Substance. And this one also, nice thick leaf. This is like a grandfather. It's been around for such a long time. Elegance doesn't need dividing. If your friends want to have some of your hosta, tell them to go buy them. Buy one for themselves because, as I mentioned, just like us, we get better as we get older. Same thing with all these wonderful hostas. Hakoni grass. Uh, this comes from Japan. Uh, this one is uh, a mop head, really gorgeous. I when the, when not, they were on sale where I was working. I bought 20 of them and put them all over the place. I use them as an edging plant. Uh, this gets more sun, so you can see it has more gold. This is another area that's in full shade. I use it as a nedger because anything that's light, you it catches your eye and you don't walk into those beds. And this obviously has more sun. They grow well in containers, zone five. This is one of my containers. This is what it looks like in the winter. So here are pansies that are really great. Um, buy them in the fall. They may bloom in the spring, in the winter for you too, and definitely in the spring. And then you yank them out when it gets hot because even though they're perennials, they do not like our heat and humidity. Uh, here is uh, the same grass in my containers. This is before the deer came. <laughs> this was by my kitchen. Uh, and this is what it looked like in the wintertime. I'm not saying I'm lazy. Uh, it's just I have other things I need to do. So I don't have time to go out and, you know, and not, not too many people go looking in my garden during the winter. And this is another plant, uh, Nestilbe, that also grows well in containers. And this has gotten, uh, this uh, old gold has gotten the award in Britain. This is the one more people are familiar with. This is Oriola. This again is one of my containers. And look, it the, the new, uh, blades come through and after a while it fills it up you can't even tell that i never cleaned up in the winter time or early spring and again as i mentioned before anytime you have either fine foliage dissected foliage or grassy foliage plant it near something that has a nice wide leaf a broad leaf here are some of my containers through the years. This is when I had no deer. These are containers. Look how beautiful all these plants look together. These are several containers together. Here it is with that uh, bleeding heart. And here is in another area. You can see it's kind of shady. Liriope, it's a nice uh, grass-like plant, lily turf. People thought it was in the lily family, the iris family. Turns out that it's in the asparagus family. Can you believe it? Anyway, it has these leaves. They're somewhat evergreen. It all depends. They have these wonderful blooms that turn into these blackberries that the uh, uh, birds like. Here, this is a deep cut that they, add, they, have, they use this as an edging. Long blooming, really nice. You can tell it's under a tree, so it's nice and drought tolerant once it's established. Here are some other varieties. Uh, the blooms are either white or bluish um, and uh, an easy, really long blooming, easy plant to have. <laughs> I'm sorry, I didn't mean to jump. 
Um, I stall very easily. Okay, sedum. Sedums usually love the sun. This is our native New Jersey sedum that loves the shade. I've seen, and it doesn't mind moisture either. I've seen it growing in the middle of a creek. Um, it uh, has these wonderful blooms that uh, nectar paradise, really nice, spreads very nicely, very drought, drought tolerant. This is in the wild. Look how nice it looks like. It looks with the columbine. Um, and uh, here you see it says it's a larval host. Well, what does that mean? It means that butterflies, see these wonderful butterflies? They lay their eggs on plants that their babies which are the caterpillars, are just like our babies. They're very fussy eaters. So they need specific plants in order to lay their eggs so when they hatch, those little babies will have something to eat. Now, why is that important in the scheme of things? It's important because all these wonderful caterpillars or larvae, who loves them besides the butterflies and the moths? Birds. Baby birds in the spring cannot eat seeds or anything hard. So the mother bird has to go out there and find something soft and squishy for the little babies. So in the scheme of things, if you're interested in pollinators and butterflies and moths, you ho hopefully plant plants that are larval hosts like uh, this sedum. If you have a shady area, this is an aster that grows very well and spreads. It's a native. You can see it loves butterfly. Butterflies love it, and it will spread nicely, especially in sandy soil. I have to hurry up because we're still doing full shade. Oh, I am so sorry. You need to go to Mount Cuba. Look at the, how it grows well under trees. Uh, monk's hood. Who doesn't love blue in the fall? When you see all the rust and yellow and oranges and reds, this is a wonderful plant that grows well. No, no maintenance. I have a monk's hood that has been growing in my um, some beds for years that I've ignored. There's some that I've ignored for about 10 years and they keep coming back. They dry very easily. Uh, they develop a long taproot, so they are very drought tolerant. Uh, they are poisonous, and uh, in mystery books and in real life, uh, the poison is aconite, and some husbands have kind of um, disappeared. Um, and it's not really traceable in autopsy, so nobody got any ideas about why you want to grow this plant. You want to grow it because of those beautiful blue blooms. Um, here are plants, uh, the coleus, that do very well in containers and in the garden and can take full shade. Uh, foliage plants go to the garden center inside. House plants are great. And tropicals. Tropicals grow very well in containers and in a uh, garden bed. Uh, part shade. Um, all these plants are listed, so if you can't stay, you may leave. No worries. This is a, if you only have one shrub, this is evergreen, one shrub that you can grow in your part shade landscape or garden, this is the plant to get because deer don't eat it. And this is what it looks like in the spring, all these beautiful uh, blooms. And this is what it looks like in the fall and through winter. All these little buds hang around all winter long and then open up into these beautiful blooms. Now, just because the buds are red doesn't necessarily mean that the blooms are going to be red too. But what's really wonderful, not all of them, but some, oh, I'm sorry. Here are some of the blooms. They are bicolored or one color, small, long, elongated, really very pretty. And they last for quite a while. But what's really amazing, and hummingbirds love it, what's really amazing is some of them, this is what the new foliage looks like. So from far away, you think you have poinsettias growing in your yard, but it's actually the Andromeda or Pieris with the new foliage. Now it comes variegated also. Look how pretty the buds are, the blooms. But what's really exciting about this one, which you really should get, 
is look at what the new foliage looks like. This is how it starts. And as the season progresses, it goes into more yellow or cream and then more like this. And then finally it goes into this, but what a show. And this is in part shade. This is uh, Inkberry Holly Strong Box. Usually Inkberry Hollies are uh, leggy. They grow tall and the foliage, you don't see it on the, the stems. This one it is well branched all the way to the bottom. It's small, two to three feet high and wide, never needs pruning. Yes, it's in the Holly family. So yes, it needs a male in order to for the female to have berries. But this one, unfortunately, they haven't found the male yet that can take on this beautiful female. And these are the blooms. Caria. Oh, God, I had this is one of my God. This was in my garden many years ago. It blooms its little butt off from April to May. This is what it looks like. It looks like roses. And then on and off all season long. Very long blooming. And then the deer came. And unfortunately, I don't have them anymore because they love it. They just eat it all up. It also comes in uh, a single rather than a double. But what's nice is the stems during the winter are green and you don't have to be uh, cutting off stems in order for them to always be green. All the stems, no matter how old or young they are, will be green through the winter. Bathagilla. This is a dwarf one uh, that only grows three feet tall. The blooms look like a bottle brush. They start before even the leaves come in. When the leaves come in, they, they have this nice grayish bluish tinge to them. And then in the fall, it has a, it's like a kaleidoscope of colors, <laughs> nice fall colors, really beautiful. The more sun it gets, the more colorful the foliage is. And the blooms are very uh, aromatic and the deer don't eat this plant. Spirea. Deer don't eat this plant either. This is a nice one. There's a whole double play series that's put out. And what's nice about this is this is what the leaves look like when they first appear. And then in the fall and the blooms are nice deep pink and they keep blooming all season long and they're larger than the regular Spirea. And the whole double play series, they have white blooms, different kinds of foliage colorings. So please explore that online. This is really a wonderful plant to get. No care at all. And hummingbirds just flock to this plant. No pruning needed. An average soil so you don't have to go nuts. And look at everything that it can take except standing water. This is aronia or chokeberry covered with these beautiful blooms. Uh, mid to late spring, uh, the dark, but these are deciduous, meaning the leaves fall. They don't stay. They're not evergreen. The leaves are a nice, lustrous, deep green. And then they're covered with these beautiful blooms that turn into these nice dark uh, berries or droops that you can eat, but wait until two frosts. Otherwise, uh, they're very astringent, hence the name chokeberry. So uh, you can make wine out of it, jellies, jams, um, really a wonderful plant. And aronias usually are tall shrubs. This is uh, one that is short and well-rounded and well-branched and can tolerate clay for those of you who have my problem. And look at all that it can tolerate. Sun, drought, humidity, wet, nice. <coughs> Uh, this was developed for the florist. The blooms are football size, beautiful uh, pistachio uh, type blooms. So heavy sometimes that the stems kind of tend to bend. 
And what's nice about them, look at what happens as it gets cooler. This is when you go there and you cut it and you dry it so you can make either a wreath or a flower arrangement because it's really lovely. Look at the beautiful foliage that it has in the fall. And this, uh, this limelight is one of the most adaptable, drought-tolerant hydrangea out of all of them. So if you have a hard time with hydrangeas, this is the one to get. Fucara or coral bells, they went nuts with the coloring. Not only the coloring, but look at the veining, really lovely. Uh, the blooms um, used to be red, pink. Now they come in white and they're starting to come back. The pink ones, really nice. The deer don't eat them because it has a fuzzy leaf. It is evergreen. Uh, you need to go to Mount Cuba. If you don't go there in person, go on their site because they trial a whole slew of plants, including coral bells. This is one of the reports that they put out after they're done with their trials. So you can see how they uh, they plant a, a whole host of varieties and leave them there for four years. They coddle them until they're established and then they basically leave them alone. And then they will write a report on which, one do, which ones do the best and uh, they make recommendations. So you really need to go on that site. Also, Chicago Botanic Garden does trials on a whole host of plants, too. So if you're looking to populate your garden with a whole bunch of plants, you need to go to both these sites so that you can see which plants to buy that will come back because you don't want to be wasting your money. This is citronelle. This was one of the top five or top ten. Comes from France with this beautiful chartreuse foliage, which looks more gold the more sun it gets. And it has a silver underside. And the blooms are white that the hummingbirds love. Uh, look at this. This is no blooms here, but look, you have the yukara or the coral bells, Japanese painted fern, the hasta. Look how colorful and beautiful this look, despite the fact that there are no blooms. So again, foliage is important. I love this plant. This is such a cutie and it looks so delicate, but it's evergreen, believe it or not. Granted, it huddles and sort of looks small in the winter time, but in the spring, this is what it looks like. And then it keeps blooming sporadically the whole season long with these beautiful uh, dainty flowers as well as look how dainty the foliage is. It's like tiered one on top of each other. Really beautiful. Uh, and if you were to pick only one plant to have in your garden in part shade, this is the one to get because the deer don't eat them, because they don't like highly dissected fo foliage like this one does. This has these pantaloon-shaped blooms that bloom from spring until frost all season long, and you do not have to deadhead. And the deer, they don't eat it. They don't even eat the blooms. And if it's happy, it will self-sow. This is a cultivar. This luxuriant is a hybrid of our native eastern fringe bleeding heart and the one in the west, Formosa, Diocentra Formosa, and they put them together and they got luxuriant, which will do very well. And you see highly dissected leaves go really well with a, being planted by broad leafed uh, plants. This is another native, believe it or not, this plant has either male plant or female plant. And guess which one looks the best, excuse me, better? The male plant, because the male plant has to look best. <laughs> so this must be the female plants, this must be, excuse me, this must be the male, female, really a beautiful plant. It says here three to six feet high. I've had them growing in front of my house where I have a garden 
and they never got higher than maybe two feet. So I guess it all depends on how much sun, how much moisture, or whatever that it gets to be that tall. This is the beautiful foliage in the fall. And this is another plant that's a host plant. It does sell so, which is really nice. So it, they must have pollinized out there in front of my house when I wasn't looking. But look at how beautiful the attributes that it has. And here it is in a bed with hosta. Look how tall it is. And here it is on the side. And this is what the seeds look like uh, throughout the winter. So if you can, leave them for the birds and also for winter interest. Just think how pretty that looks with the snow on it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't mean to jump. It's eight o'clock. If you can say stay. If you can't, I'm sorry. Okay, this is from Mount Cuba. This is a, an Actia, um, and it has beautiful gray green foliage that is full all the way to the ground. So you don't have to plant anything in front of it because it's leggy. It has these blooms in late April. And what's wonderful, what's amazing about this Actia is that it blooms early, whereas other Actias bloom in the um, latter part of the season. After it's done blooming, what you have in the fall, midsummer to fall, are these doll's eyes that the birds just love. Um, it's a great plant and very long-lived. Astilbes. Astilbes are great. They do like rich soil. So if you don't want to mend your soil, you should at least fertilize. They come in all these different colors. Each plume is packed with all with hundreds of tiny little flowers that open up and uh, consecutively, so it makes for a nice long bloom period. And what's nice about a still bees is that the deer don't eat them, but also they come in all these different types of foliage, mostly in green foliage, but they have this different coloring. One of the best ones, I think, is this Amber Moon, which is a Chinensis a still bee. Chinensis comes from China, obviously, but the Chinensis uh, a still bees are more drought tolerant than other astilbes. The new leaves come in uh, red and uh, gold, and then uh, go into gold, and then into light green. And they have these stubby pink flowers uh, that are really nice and leave them for the birds. Very long lived. And this one I grow in my garden. This is not my garden. I use this one as a ground cover. This is also a chinensis. This is pumala. And this one spreads really nicely. And I use it as a ground cover. And weeds don't go through. And this went through the uh, this past summer's uh, drought period. It died back, but then it came back. So this is a really long-lived, very hardy makes a wonderful ground cover under trees, which is what I have. Coloni, just like Chianti with the CH, Coloni leonii hot lips. This is a wonderful end of the season a bloomer with these hot pink uh, blooms and blooms for a very long time. Uh, it blooms up on top and then you can, you can see uh, that it has all of these buds. And then at each leaf node, there are more buds that open up. So it's a long bloomer. I used to grow this. It can take wet very well, but just because it can take wet doesn't mean that it can't grow in ordinary soil. The only thing that it cannot take is deer. Deer love it and I can't grow it. Uh, pollinators love it, including uh, hummingbirds. This is an elegant plant and I used to grow it too. I think my groundhogs ate it. It has these maple-like leaves that are gorgeous. The branches are really, it's up to 36 inches high and wide. And as the season progresses, the branches, they start bending over because of the weight of all the buds. And look at these buds, aren't they cool? They look like little yellow eggplants. And they open up into these beautiful shuttlecock uh, blooms, yellow blooms. 
uh, that uh, really look nice. And then for some strange reason, the seed pods, the seeds look like they came from outer space. Really interesting plant. And again, look at this nice broad leaf. And what do you have in front of it? Grass-like foliage, little uh, leaf foliage, and other smaller leaf foliage. So even if this weren't blooming, look how pretty. Yes, you can even grow fruit, and that's in your uh, in your handout. Granted, it rather would it would rather have sun, but it can take some shade, but not too much. Okay, I will end this with plants to avoid. You know, when you have shade, you're basically hard up for plants. You're desperate to have nice plants to grow there. However, there are some plants that I have bought all of these and have cursed a lot because very hard to get rid of. These, this is I, this is a native. I know you can't grow. Say it's invasive. You have to say it's aggressive because it's a native. But don't even plant this in a container. This one or this one because it self sows like crazy. I've been yanking these out for a minimum of fifteen years. You can't get rid of them really hard. This one spreads, so you can plant it in container. This just takes over. But I don't mind. I have it in my wooded area, and it just spread, spread, spread. This is the one I showed you in the beginning. Look how pretty it looks. Yes, pretty but deadly. This is another one. Chameleon plant, if you like it, make put it in a pond. It grows well in a pond in a pot. I know Deep Cut had a whole bunch on one on a slope. It took them years to get rid of it. I still have it and I'm still yanking it out. This is outlawed, I know, in Pennsylvania. This self sows and it overtakes areas that uh, where native plants grow and all the birds and other uh, wildlife cannot have their food or their seeds or whatever because this plant displaces them so please don't grow this this is another one look how cute it looks this one i had a hard time getting rid of too and I, it had I, it was under a tree and it was dry and oh my god it just hung around forever it finally went away Bamboo, no bamboo, unless it's a clumping bamboo, and it has to be clumping. <laughs> okay, here it is. We're at the end. Ah, uh, not only ah uh, because it's the end, but also because look at the beautiful, how beautiful this looks, and only this uh, eczemia or dicentra is blooming. But even without the blooms, look how beautiful it looks. And again, fewer weeds so you can rest in the hammock. So thank you, thank you so much for your attention. I hope I didn't go over too much. Oh, only seven minutes. That's not too bad, I'm usually worse. Anyway, this is one of my containers. Um, and here is another container. All three of these plants will come back if you plant them in a container. And here, I just wanted to leave you with uh, these beautiful shrubs that are this is that akuba that i was telling you this obviously got pollinized so these are the red berries but even without the berries it's very pretty um, and here this is the information that i have on the handout uh, for um, information online and gardens to visit and don't forget the high line they have a lot of great plants including a lot of native plants and uh native cultivars okay anybody have questions oh uh irene do me a favor can you go back to that slide and leave the the uh, links up even though it's going to be on the handout when we send it to everybody okay um i uh, wonderful at, oh and you were on top and that was good timing. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, we started six minutes late. So it is. Yeah. I was on time. Yep. Yep. Um, so we did have a lot of questions, um, you know, in your PowerPoint. Um, you had uh, natives and non-natives, and you had them marked out, too. And I know on your handout, you'll have uh, it delineated on there as well, if they're native or not, because um, I know I've seen your uh, handouts in the past, but a lot of people, you know, it is difficult if you see what's here in the Pinelands and you're driving down, you know, 539 or 72 even out in the, 
there's not a lot of flowering things. So sometimes you have to add a little something. We're not telling you to make your garden all, you know, invasive or no, you just add a little punch of something to help give um, a little boost to the shady garden that grows in our sandy soils. So um, I don't know, Patty, did you see any other particulars that jumped out at you? No, you know what? We, uh, Irene, we did answer a lot of the questions. Um, so right now I'm just seeing a lot of thank yous and that you're a treasure, which you are. Um, thank you. Presentation, uh, people pointing out your enthusiasm, which <laughs> I mean, it just oozes. So uh, people are scared for their pocketbooks and wallets because of the inspiration that you've provided. <laughs> Um, I don't see any questions we didn't get to. I mean, most of the questions were, um, I don't know. What were they? We answered. Yeah, um, a lot were garden specific. Um, you know, what was clay? Some people had a, a sandy soil dry. So you answered those as you went, but you know, um, those, those plant lists, which we will add to your resource, um, when we get in tomorrow and come up with a couple of resources that maybe you don't have on your list, uh, that we can give them for lists, plant lists. Yes. Yes. And I forgot to mention uh, Jersey friendly yards. Oh, do I have that site? Yes, I do have it on, yeah. on here. That has a lot of information, <laughs> especially if they're looking for natives. Yeah, uh, I do see one question. Irene, what about mosquitoes in the shaded area? I saw that the hammock and thought I would be a feast for mosquitoes. And, and <laughs> I am also, yes. I just, I, I'm a magnet. I am. Uh, you know, you have to spray uh, yourself. Uh, but I hate doing that, so I don't really go out in the evening. Or, you know, in the shady area, what I do is, uh, because I do have ticks also, I uh, use perethrin on the clothes that I spray on, uh, off me. I let them dry, and then I put them on, and I look like a, a migrant worker because they're long sleeves. I wear, uh, a, a, you know, something on my head, and uh, I reek of the pyrethrum, I think, so the mosquitoes don't come and get me. But that's what I have to do because even in the sunny area, they just, I live in an area where mosquitoes are awful. Um, that, yes, uh, and I agree. I, I am not a, uh, uh, I don't hold with spraying the properties. Um, for mosquitoes, because there's so many things it kills, but, uh, you know, you got to do what works for your situation. But yeah, I spray myself. I'll wash it off. It's less toxic in the long, maybe not to me, but to the environment in that respect. Uh, Andrea uh, had a question about maple trees. Are they particularly bad for shade plants? And I can answer if you, I mean, you can too, so. You can. Okay. Um, are they particularly bad per se? No. However, maples have sh uh, shallow roots. So therefore you would need to choose plants that are either shallow rooted and can tolerate dry areas uh, in the shade. Uh, so it can be uh, a challenge to grow underneath there. So can I just add that when you have any kind of tree that has a lot of roots, just leave it alone. Don't even bother planting there because it's an uphill battle. Because uh, there's root, uh, there's competition for moisture, and it really isn't worth it. Just either just leave it be or mulch it. Please don't buy colored mulch. <laughs> but but uh, leave it alone. Planters. It alone. What's pots, that? Plant, pots and planters. Something. You know, that's very true. Yes. Your big pots. Um, so yeah, yeah, and a couple people are. St I'm sorry. Go ahead, Patty. I was just going to say, um, th the only other question I saw was about when people will get the plant lists. Um, I don't know. We're going to, it takes a day or so to get the recording up and then we send out an email to let you know that the recording is up and the uh, handouts will be with the recording. Okay. And I, I, I'm surprised you didn't get the we transfer because I sent it to Diane also and to other people's speakers bureau and they all got it and they, they downloaded it. Yeah, I'll I'll look again and see if yeah. over. I can send it again, no big deal. Doesn't cost anything. 
Sometimes our county does block things. They keep changing security. So there may be something. Oh, really? You never know. There might have been a security update. So we'll keep a look out, but I didn't see it. Uh, yeah, I didn't see it. But... No. but no worries. We'll get it from you. Don't okay. you worry. <laughs> if I have to come to your house and download it off your computer. I'll get it from you. <laughs> and, you know, uh, as far as sharing, I meant to say to people that, you know, they can do screen save. If they see a slide that they like, or any of my talks, or if anybody gives a talk, you can do a screen save. Or if you don't know how to do that, you take your cell phone and you take a picture. Yep. You know, especially yep. of the plants that you like, because I do pack it with information. And the reason why I pack it with information is that different people are looking for different things. You know, and I want to I want to please everybody. That's what we females do, don't we? <laughs> we do. We do. Um, we but, but we do. Yeah, we do. Um, and yeah. there were some questions or sorry, some suggestions. Um, there are some uh, local. Um, uh, organizations that do have native plant sales, um, and you'll find a lot of those listed either on Jersey Friendly Yards and their resource section of where to buy plants. Um, and also, um, Native Plant Society has a great list as well. Uh, so there's definitely lots of places to because we we can't promote just one. So I, I try not to push um, specific, uh, you know, uh, growers. So, um, but we have a list. Um, always go to um, public gardens are a great place to see things. Uh, our native plant garden in the front of our building at the one, uh, 1623 Whitesville Road. We have some of these uh, native plants planted in the shade area, some non-natives as well, but we have plant lists as well there. So you guys are more than welcome to come and visit and see some things uh, in person um, and check out the different seasons uh, because yeah. your garden does change. And Bowman, exactly. And Bowman, Bowman Hills, Hill. they have plant sales also. Yep, yep, they're great. Um, I've been to Mount Cuba's great. And again, you know, they're public gardens. So, you know, if you go there, there's lots of different things to see. You're not just promoting a specific sale. Yes. And also, um, what should we call it? Um, Oh, Deep Cut Gardens, they have a plant swap, and I was speaking to the horticulturist, and this year, this coming up one, I guess they have it in September, I don't know when exactly, she said that she's going to make it native plant swap. Good. Good. Uh, cool. Yeah, yeah, so we'll be looking for, I know, um, I know there's some people that were joining us from Pennsylvania, North Jersey, so have to check with your local master gardeners um, and see if there's, um, if there's a, a plant sale that they may be hosting that would help, um, you know, uh, donation, not donate, but, you know, bring money into the program so we can offer more programs like this. Um, right. right, and Ocean County has a plant sale and there are native plants that are sold there. Monmouth County Master Gardeners also have a plant sale and I try to get uh, natives in there also. And uh, uh, Patty, I did try to put as many natives as I could. I could have put more, but I you didn't give me more time. <laughs> well, we'll have to have a special yeah. one just for you yeah. on all native plants. All natives, yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Master Gardeners in uh, Passaic also were uh, popped in here and saying that they also have a plant sale um, and uh, in May. So I mean, a lot of plant sales are in May. Middlesex as well. Um, mm -hmm. Middlesex also has a beautiful um, at Davidson Mill pond i believe park uh great layout of uh plant material and and different garden layout so it's really pretty uh to go and there as well what, what's really great about plant sales by master gardeners is these are most a, a lot of people are real gardeners so the plants that they will have in their plant sales are some plants that they've grown or are growing in their garden or that they have purchased in order to sell and the prices are really better than anywhere else where you can buy plants. Um, yeah, I think, um, and I see a couple of people at plant sales, you just kind of check around on the websites. Um, I know for the locals that we have, we do um, put it out on Facebook and, uh, but there's lots of places that, um, like I said, we'll try to give as many resources that we can um, so, cause we, we have to give you a list. We can't say just one, uh, and not everybody sells just native. So yes, you do have to do a little 
a little searching when you're out there. So uh, I want to thank everybody for staying on um, and we will send out the uh, a PowerPoint and the, again, the links and the handouts, we'll send that all out hopefully by the weekend. Um, we'll see what the what the week, what questions come in tomorrow on, on our helplines and whatnot. So Irene, I want to say thank you so much for your time. Patty as well. Thank You're you. Welcome. You know what, hey, um, if we transfer does not work for you, I can still send the um, plant list by regular email to you. That's fine. Yep. yep. We'll, we'll, like I said, we'll get it. I'll catch up yes. with you tomorrow on that. Okay. Yeah. So, all right, everybody, thank you again and thank enjoy you. the rest of your evening. And, and dream I thank you of for all the those... hour and a half. I, I yep. thank you for the hour and a half. Okay. Yeah. Wait on get time, to... too. That was amazing. The good job. Thank you. You too. Okay. All right. Happy dreams of plants, of new plants for this year. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. All Bye. right. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye. Those hearts are cute. <laughs> Is that you doing that? No, no that's, that's people's for fans. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's so nice. Look, they're giving you more hearts. Aww. There's hearts in the pot. Yeah. So I, I allowed the, uh, I forget what they call them. The, uh, um, not emojis. emojis. So. It wasn't, emo it was. Is it reactions? reactions? It was reactions. Yeah. Oh, I, that, so. I didn't know you can do that. <laughs> <laughs>